about two months ago, my sister asked me, she said, oh, did you get that letter from the Secretary of State about voting by mail? And I said, no. A coronavirus resurgence is possible this fall, and Louisiana election officials want to give senior citizens a safe option to make sure their voices are heard at the polls, but are some voters being left out? Chief investigative reporter Greg LaRose has looked into complaints about recent efforts to expand mail-in ballots. It was just two weeks ago that Secretary of State Kyle Ardwan appeared before a legislative committee to tout his efforts to keep elections safe despite the pandemic. I put aside my Republicanism, if you will. I put aside my own personal biases to come up with a plan for under an emergency situation to provide this state the best opportunities for people to exercise their right to vote in times of danger. Part of that plan was a letter Arduin sent April 1st to Louisiana voters 65 and older. It let them know they could register to vote by mail. His office says the letters went to about 315,000 voters eligible for the program. The numbers to us are not seeming to line up. Stephen Hanwork is executive director of the Louisiana Democratic Party. He says 680,000 voters in Louisiana are 65 or older. So if Arduin's letter went out to only 315,000, that would mean more than half were already in the program. It seems to me if that were the case, we would be shouting that from the rooftops. Handwork says the party has heard from roughly 300 registered Democrats who say they haven't received Arduin's letter. It just seems to give me a lot of pause that with this many reports that we have been getting of people who never received the mailing, um, it certainly seems problematic to me uh, that they did not, in fact, send it to all those eligible voters. Susan Allen of Slidell is a Democrat. Her sister and her cousin live nearby. Both are Republicans. Both told Susan they received Arduin's letter. Susan did not. And she's been registered to vote at her current address for decades. Considering the we still have this virus going around and a lot of senior citizens, which I am, I'm 72, wouldn't necessarily want to go vote in person because they don't want to get sick. Remember Arduin's appearance before lawmakers last month? He was there to oppose a bill that would have expanded mail-in voting. Its Democratic sponsor says she's heard from seniors who didn't get the Secretary of State's letter. It was rather interesting that this was sent to so many hundreds of thousands of voters without a request um, while the office was also opposing any further expansion of, of vote by mail or absentee voting. A spokesman for the Secretary of State acknowledges they've heard anecdotal reports about people not receiving the mail-in voting letter, but not about anyone who's been excluded because of their party affiliation. We requested the mailing list for the letter from the Secretary of State, who's agreed to an interview tomorrow to discuss the matter. For WDSU Investigates, I'm Greg LaRose. Well, neighbors in Gentilly are sounding off about a proposed city-run cemetery in their neighborhood. They formed a petition and they're voicing public opposition tonight to this project. It's happening in Voscoville. The head of the Neighborhood Association says the city is rushing to open a cemetery and they're doing so without notice or even input from the residents there. We talked to a number of residents in that area. Some took these photos from their backyard. That's where the cemetery will be and what they'll be looking at if it opens. Neighbors have a number of concerns, including increased traffic, diminished property values, and flooding. We're concerned that when there's a hard rain, we're close to the levee, if something should happen to that, your bodies are placed back there, they're probably going to float in our yards. Here they're making a fast, permanent decision on us. It's a permanent decision that will affect our lives forever. The biggest concern is that it isn't a residential Area. We don't want it in this residential area. We don't want it in any residential area. Now, we did reach out to the city. A spokesperson tells us in part that that site is seriously being considered to create additional public cemetery space in response to the COVID-19 pandemic that has claimed the lives of more than 400 New Orleans residents. On this first day of hurricane season, we've seen a tropical depression form. By the second day of hurricane season, 
It may be a tropical storm. Here's a look at tropical depression three winds of 30 miles per hour. It's moving to the west at seven miles per hour and it, it's not going to be going anywhere anytime soon. Here's a look at the forecast track. You see it becomes a tropical storm sometime tomorrow, uh, maybe in the afternoon or evening. It's going to get close to the Mexico coast and if it moves a little bit further inland, this system could actually diminish. If it stays over the open waters, it will turn back to the north and eventually back toward the central Gulf, but even if it does diminish, forecast models show the moisture surrounding that that gets pushed to the north could develop another system going into the central Gulf. So an interesting scenario that's going to be playing out here over the next week, but we will see some potential impacts as we go toward next weekend. Here's a look at the spaghetti models. This is a look at the solutions the models are seeing from the data that is currently in from this latest advisory and you can see a lot of those putting it further inland while others turn it back toward the north and you see some of the spaghetti plots going toward Louisiana, some heading toward Texas. And so the takeaway message from looking at that is there's still a lot of uncertainty with what's going to be happening with tropical depression three. However, it has moved back over the open waters and that's why it has become a tropical depression starting to see some convection firing up closer toward its center, but it's disorganized. A lot of that connect convection still over the Yucatan Peninsula peninsula, but it's moving over favorable conditions for development with the warmer waters in the Bay of Campeche in the low to the mid 80s. Let's check out some of these scenarios. And in fact, the European model actually does diminish it over Mexico. You see it kind of lose uh, its intensity there, but keeping the low here to kind of guide you on what's going to be happening. Some of this moisture gets pulled to the north and it may regenerate another system as we go toward the weekend. And so what's going to be happening is a lot of this moisture is going to get pushed on shore. Could see the potential for some coastal flooding with the winds pushing the water on shore and then some rounds of some heavy rainfall going into the weekend, especially looking towards Sunday and Monday. And it has the system going toward Texas before making a turn back toward the northeast by the middle part of the week. But notice we still have some rainfall around. The American model is actually a little bit faster by Saturday afternoon. Doesn't have it too far off from the coast, but it too will bring some heavy rainfall across the Florida Panhandle and then across southeast Louisiana late Sunday into Monday. Whether this will be a tropical depression, a tropical storm, it's still just kind of unknown uh, based on what could be happening as this interacts with the land near Mexico. So the takeaway message here is it's too soon to know direct impacts right now. We've got a lot of time to watch it, but we could see some downpours going into the weekend. Right now, though, things are pretty quiet. Some clouds continue to move through. We have some rainfall still across parts of Texas. We'll get back into our pattern tomorrow of some afternoon rain and storms. You see a little bit of coverage on Tuesday. Then as we go into Wednesday, some more widespread coverage. So some locally heavy rain still going to be possible as we head through the week. Then, of course, we are watching the tropics and we'll continue to fine tune that forecast as we head toward the weekend. Here with medical editor Dr. Corey A. Bear, the governor says today that the state ready to move into phase two. The mayor of New Orleans says not so fast. What's at play here? Yeah. Well, basically, we have to remember the governor is in charge of our whole state, and that means that there's lots of rural parishes, some parishes that are a little more urban, but New Orleans is a very special place. We are very urban, very close knit, very dense. So what we must do is remember that if we opened up all the way, then people would come from miles around and not socially distance people that probably wouldn't even live here. So the mayor of our city has to do a little bit more to protect the citizens in a little different way than the governor. Both of them doing everything they can to protect the people that they serve so readily. So it's, it's a, just a very different vibe that they both have to handle. Uh, Dr. A. Bear, we know that today is the first day of hurricane season. We already have some activity, tropical depression uh, in the Gulf. Uh, tell us, this is stressful when you combine that with COVID-19, thinking about both of them. I mean, this, yeah. you know, gets your stress level up. I mean, 2020 has been a mess. That's all I can say. We have civil unrest. We have COVID-19. We have, you know, just hurricane season starting now. If you're having some feelings of anxiety, which I'm sure most of you do, but if these feelings start to tip over into depression, please don't just sit there. You must talk to someone. You must reach out to your family, friends, your counselors. You must reach out to your psychiatrist, take your medicine, because this is way too much stress for really almost anyone. But if you have a pre-existing psychiatric illness, you need to be in contact with your support system, whatever that is, because you cannot just be there alone. It is, it is 
a lot of stress and right now it's only going to get more stressful as hurricane season goes on the civil unrest goes on and COVID-19 is going nowhere folks so just remember please reach out if you have any type of depression or definitely any feelings of suicide uh, because we, we need you and we can't have that happening here in our city we just kind of we're here for you and, and Dr. Abear, just right quick, one more thing. Uh, we saw, you talked about civil unrest. We saw a protest in the city earlier this evening, but those folks are bunched up together. Nobody, from what you can see, appears to be social distancing. What's the thought there? Yeah, I mean, it, ironically, they're wearing a lot of masks, which for whatever reason, there might be multiple reasons, but the point is that we need to right now make sure that if you go out there, be safe, keep your distance and wear your mask. Very, very important. All right, medical editor Dr. Corey Abear, thanks for your time. Always good advice. Uh, you can always email your questions to askdrabear at wdsu.com. Good evening, everybody. I'm Fletcher Mackle reporting tonight live from my home in Mid-City, and we are talking about the murder of George Floyd and how it has affected not only the sports landscape worldwide, but specifically here in New Orleans, the New Orleans Saints and the New Orleans Pelicans. On Monday afternoon, Saints and Pelicans owner Gail Benson released a statement calling Floyd's murder tragic and senseless. She went on to add that she and several players are starting a social justice leadership coalition to advocate for changes in black and brown communities. Benson's statement reads in part, Today we spoke with Demario Davis, Lonzo Ball, and J.J. Redick. These players are passionate about finding a solution and working in solidarity with their fellow teammates. They are all committed to change, addressing action items, and building towards future social change. And on Monday evening, the Pelicans' leadership, Executive Vice President David Griffin, Vice President Swin Cash, and Head Coach Alvin Gentry all took part in a powerful NBA roundtable to discuss racism, police brutality, and a shared responsibility to bring about change. 
I worry about my son. I worry about him having a button nose and smiling right now and becoming 6'6 six, six like his dad and him looking, people looking at him as a threat. And the only way to change that is if everybody unites together and figures out how, we be be how we're better as a country. And until that's done, I still will not sleep at night because I'll be worrying about my child. So my plea is for everybody to all have all hands on deck right now. We're really blessed to live in a community like New Orleans that has an African-American female mayor. We have an African-American police chief. We have an incredibly um, diverse ethnic mix here in New Orleans. And we have a diverse mix in our 